Ooh, that looks tasty. Oh, I, I've merchants before. Merchants in a cove. Merchant on a dale. Oh, on the Silk Road in the Middle Ages. Even in Amsterdam and Key Flower. I've merchants on a starship. I've merchants in a castle and battle. I've been a merchant just about every single place you can imagine. But now... I get to Merchant on the Dark Road. Welcome, folks. Today, the Hungry Gamer is back with another game review. And today, we are talking about Merchants of the Dark Road, designed by Brian Shore, with art by Andrew Bosley, with design, graphic design by Matt Paquette, and published by Elf Creek Games. And I do apologize if I mispronounce any of those names. And before I get started, please make sure you turn on your Klingon subtitles, because if I make any mistakes in the rules overview, that is where you'll find the corrections. Now, what Merchants of the Dark Road is, is it is a Euro game that utilizes a rondel system. In fact, not just a rondel system, many different rondels. And in this game, you live in a world where it is light, for half of the year, then dark for half of the year. And when the dark half of the year turns up, that is when the merchants start hitting the dark road and traveling around to deliver things into the, well, scary part of the land. And you can see the scary part of the land all the way over here. Now, if you are not interested in how this game is played and just want to jump into my final thoughts, then you want to go to the timestamp on the screen right now. For those of us still here, let's talk briefly about how this game is played. So what you will see is you will see that we have this core rondelle here, which has five different spaces. And each of these spaces is connected to two different actions that you can select. Let me move this out of the way. So if you are here, you can go to the Grand Bazaar up here or to the Ringway Inn down here. If you're up here, you can go to the Queen's Commissions or the Great Bazaar. Over here, you can go to Excursions or the Commissions. Down here, you can go to the Dark Market or the excursions. And while I'm not gonna go into great depth about how all of these work, I will say that down here at the dark market, you're able to spend money to move this around this mini rondel, and wherever it stops, you'll get whatever happens to be there, be it two different goods, or a commission from up here, or one of these deeds, which are in-game scoring bonuses. Over here, at the end, you're gonna be able to sell items that you have to the various customers here, and that will, one, get you some money, and then whoever you have will come with you on your journey down to the dark road because they have gotten what they wanted, and now they're trying to go home. In addition to that, each one of them is going to give you some kind of bonus. Now, over here at the Great Bazaar, you'll see we have this wheel, this little magnetic wheel here that spins around. And each of these different types of items, weapons, books, instruments, whatever, will be rotating around and having different prices as you go through. And then on... The different spots there will be these five different dice and these five dice will correlate to one of the different items and you might have two on one or only one whatever it may be but as you go to the great bazaar you'll be able to adjust the prices or perhaps you'll take one and move it somewhere else and you'll be able to make purchases so in this case i could buy one potion for three one armor for one a staff for two or two loots for just one. Then moving right along, we have the Queen's Commission so over here, which are basically jobs to the different towns out along the dark road and what the queen wants you to send. So Farglin here, for this commission, you would need to take a book, an armor, and a loot to get the most prestige for that. And then down here, we have Yurg's Excursions, and you have two choices when you go there. You will either be able to explore these ruins here, which again is another mini rondelle, depending on how many different heroes you have hired from the end to come with you, or I should say have hired you, and it goes around. That will allow you to gain extra fancy goods, which will be worth more in the long run. And then you'll also be able to spend a lantern to roll the special ruins die, which will give you extra bonuses. Or you can do the main thing you're going to be doing in this game, which is travel the dark road out here. And what you'll see is there are three different regions, and you're going to pick one of those regions that you want to go to, and each player will be able to choose to come along or not, and they'll be going and deciding which town in the region the leader is going to they want to visit. And you can drop off those heroes, like I mentioned before. For example, this guy right here. So as you can see, maybe he goes there, and if you deliver him there, you're going to get 
two gold for doing that. And if you're lucky, you're also going to have some lovely Scorchborn commissions, and you'll be able to deliver those two to get some prestige. And those two terms will make sense in just a bit. But in order to get there, you're going to have to travel the dark road. And the way that works is once everyone's decided if they're going or not, you'll get to select one of a variety of different companions that are out there and they will come with you. And they'll have different abilities that they'll be able to use throughout the game. Most of them, though not all, will require the use of the Shining Quartz resource that you can get various places and give you different abilities. But what will happen is, once you decide where you're going, you'll draw your card, and then for each player that is going on the Dark Road, you'll roll one die. There are ways to get additional dice, but let's just pretend that we are in a three-player game and three players are going with no bonus dice. And so we would roll the dice, and we see we have two sixes and a two. And then the player leading the expedition would get to pick first, and obviously he would pick the six, which means he would either get a Night Poem commission or a Scorchborn commission. If there was a three, four, or five, you could get a Shining Quartz, and you notice a one or a two would wind up causing you to lose something as you're going through. The other option is you can always re-roll all the dice that are left. Let's say the first two players went and they took those sixes. Well, the third player could spend one of their lanterns to re-roll all the remaining dice. And well, that went poorly for them, but we'll pretend that they rolled a four and they wound up getting themselves a nice shining quartz instead. The other option is to spend three lanterns to go on a lit road. Now, the lit road is pretty much more dangerous. You'll see it's much harder to get a good bonus, and the person leading the expedition actually gets to choose the dice last, so a much higher risk. You're wondering why on earth would you do that? And the reason is because at the end of the expedition, you are going to get rewards. And as you can see, this over here is based on the commission that you're doing. So for example, if I went to Night Poem and I took with me two loots, I would get three prestige. And I would get more prestige if any of those loots were upgraded loots. And if I happen to have all three of these, two loots and an armor, I would get six prestige. Then the person who led the expedition will get to choose one of these rewards down here, either an illuminated die, which is just a bonus on the action selection board, which I haven't shown you yet. It can be another one of the deeds, which are these, which are the in-game scoring conditions that I mentioned. It can be three coins or a permanent upgrade to your wagon, which I haven't shown yet. And for the most part, you can only have one of those in a game. Now, the other thing you probably noticed are these buildings that are out around the board. And there's a couple of them right here I'll show you. And these are kind of on the corners. Now, these are only going to be able to be activated if you use that illuminated die that I talked about. And I'm going to show you how that works right now very, very briefly. So here we have a player's wagon. And down here you have space for your... Shining Quartz and Horseshoes, which I haven't talked about, but just know it's another resource that you'll use. You have space over here for your goods. You'll notice that they are different size, so you're always going to be having to manage how it is that you are filling that space, because if you run out of space, you are out of space. You have space at the top for three different heroes, and then on the side, you have space for three different commissions that you can have as you're going out. But the core of the game is this Rondell action selection that I talked about. Now, this is kind of set up as a mid-game setup here. But what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking one of your dice from the bottom of the board, which will be randomly rolled. I'll just change that number there. And you're going to push it up onto one of these three spots. Now, if you push it up to the first spot, whatever number you put there will craft one of these goods. So if I put a three there, I'm going to wind up getting a staff, which we will just say I will put right there into my wagon. Then the number that goes up to the top, that's how many spaces you're going to move around the rondelle. So in this case, I would move one space. Then the die would go away. The second one here, if I push up into that, this die goes straight up through there and over, and I can either get myself another lantern, which I use to light the path, if you remember, and sometimes you can use that to reroll dice, or I could use my illuminated die. Now, if I use my illuminated die, I'll be using this number to move three spaces, but it's also going to allow me to activate these buildings in addition to the other spaces. So by using the illuminated die, you get to do a whole bunch of stuff, but they are particularly hard to get because for the most part, you're only getting these when you lead a journey out into the dark road. Then this last space over here, when you push up through there, you're simply going to get two coins or get to adjust the market by one space. If you recall, the market is the magnetic wheel. And every time you run off all your dice down here, 
you'll take one, you'll discard it, you'll reroll the rest, and put them back down there. Eventually, you'll run out of those dice, and then you only have these three left, and you'll push them up, and you'll do them as well. And then when that happens, the game will be over. Once the game ends, you're going to look at your prestige score, which is the tracker around the side of the board, which you can see right here. You're going to look at that score, and you're going to compare that with how much money you happen to have. In this case, I have eight. So I have 10 prestige and eight coins, which means my base score is going to be eight. Then to that, I'm going to add any particular bonuses I have from the deeds that I've collected, and any illuminated dice I have will add one more point as well. Whoever has the highest score will be the winner. So what do I like about this game? The first thing that I really enjoy is the massive amount of options that you have in the game. You can go through a game and there are some actions that you literally might not take at all. And personally, I really like that. I like that every time you play, there's different paths you can take and different options that you have. And I think it works really well and really is a highlight of this particular game. I also like the way that the scoring at the end of the game works. I really do enjoy that you're picking the lower of your money and your prestige as your base score and then adding whatever's left on top of that. Because what it does is it keeps you from just laser focusing in on one thing. You have to continually adjust what you're doing to try to make sure those two scores are roughly close together as you're going along through the game. And I think that is just wonderful. The next thing I'll say is I think that this game has a production and a look that is almost fantastic. Almost. There's one thing that I feel is a bit of a letdown, but I'll talk about that when I get to the end of it. But for the most part, I think the art is really good. I think the components are really good. I love the little magnetic wheel that's on there. I love the illuminated die buildings that you can have and the double-sidedness of them and the way the characters look and the way the animals look and the way the critters look. All of those things I think is really good. And I will also say I've seen the deluxe components. I'm half sad that I didn't decide to pick up the deluxe coins because those things are awesome, but they're just a little bit too pricey for me, so I didn't do it. I stuck with my basic retail pledge, but the coins and stuff that are cardboard and come with it also are very nice and they look quite good. The next thing that I'll say that I enjoy, and it goes along with the earlier thing I said about all the different options that you have, there is a fun bit of management to the game as you're managing the different things in your inventory and your wagon along with the heroes that are coming with you and the different commissions that you have, because you can only have a limited amount of these things. So you can't just pile up a whole bunch of stuff and have one huge score at any given moment because you don't have enough space. And because you can tag along with other people when they go, you're also wanting to make sure that you have something at the various regions. So when someone else goes somewhere, you're going to be able to tag along and get more than just a dice roll, which in theory could hurt you. Speaking of the dice rolls, I really like the adventuring. I like the throwing of the dice and you get some kind of bonus. I like the companions that are always coming with you, and I like how all of that works together. I like that there is some dice mitigation to it. There's a significantly more dice mitigation to it when it comes to moving around the rondelle, but really all of the dice throwing, I really like. Now, here's the thing, though. I like that because I like chaos, and to me, this game is more of a hybrid Euro Amera style game because there's so much dice chucking in this game. It's more along the lines of a Dwellings of Eldervale style game than it is to something, say, like a Coloma or something like that that's just really Euro Euro. And the last two things I think work really well are just all the different rondelles. I think all the different rondelles that you're using and dealing with are satisfying. They all operated differently, that you activate them differently, and I think they all work. And it really has created a system to where you're trying to look one or two turns ahead because like, okay, if I move three now, that's going to let me use this thing over here. But then all I have left are these other dice, which means I'm going to be wanting to move four because that's all I have left. And that's not going to work. So I need to move four first. And then I need to specifically pull this die up. So the next time I can use this other die. And the way that you're managing the ability to get to the different positions around the rondelle, I think is very, very, very fun. And then the final thing that I, I enjoy is I do like the way the solo bot works. It is pretty easy to operate. And while it's not particularly brilliant, 
It's not the most amazing bot I've ever seen in a Euro game, but what makes it really shine for me is that I can take that and put it in a two-player game or a three-player game, and it is set up to work that way. And for me, that is what I look for in a bot in a Euro game. Is it quick and easy to operate? I don't care if it scores a little differently, if it has a couple of different things that operate differently like this one does. Can I use it quickly and easily? And can I also substitute it into a small player count game? And for this one, I can, so I really do like that. So what are my quibbles with the game? And the first one is something that I've already praised. Two things I've already praised. One, there's a ton of options out there. And so that can leave you feeling like you are rudderless. And along with that, there are times towards the end of the game where suddenly you have what feels like a wasted die, a wasted move, because you just don't have anything that is useful anymore. And then along with that, I've also already praised the dice chucking aspect and all the dice and that kind of randomness, that chaos, that might be antithetical to what you like about a Euro game. Like I said, this feels more like a Dwellings of Eldervale than it does a Flamecraft or any other type of Euro game that you might be looking at. Flamecraft's a bad example, but you know what I mean. And then my only other quibble has to do with the production of the game. I think the retail version looks great. I love the art. I love the way it looks. It's a very big board, but it looks nice. Everything looks nice about it. Maybe you're bothered by the fact that the ruins rondelle is not a circle, it's a square. I don't know, it doesn't bother me, though I did play with somebody who bugged them. It doesn't really bother me. But what does disappoint me are the goods. They're just plain, simple pictures of the goods. And when everything else looks so amazing, these stand out as being plain. And it is well, it's a little bit disappointing considering how amazing the rest of the components are. And I'm just talking about the retail components. And that said, even when you get the deluxe stuff, those aren't upgraded. They're just plain white, or you flip them over, they're gold. And I think it's just a bit of a miss to where with all this amazing art, they didn't take the amazing art and put it on the goods as well. Even if it was just one specific looking weapon or one specific looking staff or one specific looking book that was just repeated, that to me would have kept the immersion through the art in the game. But there you have it, folks. That is Merchants of the Dark Road. I'm enjoying this one. This is one that I'm looking forward to playing with three and four people again. I really had a good time that first time I played. It was with four people. We didn't really know what we were doing, but I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to being able to play again and drop the bot into the game to see how that goes. I think this is a game that has a lot to offer. If you are interested in that little bit of hybrid nature of it, because you got all the, that because you have all that dice chucking in there and that randomness and those kind of rondelles on rondelles on rondelles. So there you have it, folks. That is Merchants of the Dark Road. As always, if I made any mistakes in the rules overview, please let me know in the comments with a timestamp. I'll get that into the Klingon subtitles. As always, if you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.